dialogues on how to improve the effectiveness of development cooperation. Just quickly on the background, I hope that you have seen and you can retrieve both bios and the concept note in the app. Uh, but the background to this session, of course, stems from achieving the sustainable development goals requires scaling up effective cooperation and partnerships across public, private, international and national stakeholders. So in this context, the four principles for effective development cooperation, country ownership, inclusive partnerships, focus on results, and transparency and mutual accountability are of critical importance. We've heard that throughout the last few days. An action dialogue is a multi-stakeholder dialogue in the country level, which aims to build a shared understanding and agree on concrete steps to strengthen effectiveness of cooperation and partnerships. It is meant as a dialogue or as a series of dialogues, which I will say, led by a partner country government as a means to engage with all relevant stakeholders and partners to reflect on the challenges and opportunities for improving effectiveness of development cooperation and partnerships and what collective actions are needed in a country's own development and partnership context. Action dialogues support partner countries and development actors to agree on concrete steps and generate political buy-in for joint actions to strengthen the effectiveness of cooperation and partnerships by drawing on commitments based on the four effectiveness principles to guide how stakeholders better can partner together in support of nationally expressed development priorities, building on evidence from the global partnership monitor monitoring rounds where these are available. So the action dialogues can stimulate reflections on understanding national priorities and the state of effective development cooperation at the country level, key opportunities for leveraging the effectiveness principles to drive development cooperation efforts, opportunities and actions needed to increase the effectiveness of cooperation and partnerships. It can also identify key issues that require multi-stakeholder collaboration. And in the longer term, the outcomes of action dialogues are intended to promote policy, system and behavioural changes. Again, something we've he heard repeated during these days. As an integral part of the cycle to advance the effectiveness of development cooperation. So with that short background to this session, let me take the seat and continue uh, by saying that it is an honour again to welcome you to this uh, a 13th spotlight session and say that we have a tremendous panel that I will be inviting to the floor. First on my list is actually Madame Pon Van Utavong. She's Deputy Minister of Planning and Investment of Lao PDR. Please. We have uh, Mr. Philippe Lasmel, Director General of Aid of uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Bienvenue. We have José uh, Luis Murillo Frias, Director of International Cooperation from the Dominican Republic. Bienvenido. We have Antonio González Norris, Executive Director of the International Cooperation Agency in Peru. Bienvenido. And last but not least, we have Ms. Elomo Andela, Head of Research and Partnerships of the Collective for Food Security and Rural Development based in Cameroon. So we're lucky to have with us here today an exceptional panel representing governments and civil society from several parts of the world working across different development contexts to share with us how action dialogues have or can contribute to change development cooperation, bringing more and also better results from our development cooperation with the overall aim of leaving no one behind. With a lot to discuss and no time to lose, uh, allow me some introductory remarks before turning to our distinguished pan panel. Let me be blunt and repeat a few words from the last few days. The 2030 Agenda will not be achieved without a new strong surge of coordinated action. And that is true for development cooperation both within and across all countries. 
In the words of the UN Secretary General at the 77th General Assembly, the SDGs are issuing an SOS, he said. And that was repeated by the Deputy Secretary General earlier this week. Even the most fundamental goals on poverty, hunger and education are going into reverse. And we know, of course, COVID-19's pervasive impacts, the more recent triple crisis on energy, food and finance, the now very tangible triple planetary crisis of nature, pollution and climate change, they have affected and will continue to affect all countries unless we work harder. That's for a brief and sobering picture of the development context, because the question before us today is what does this mean for the way that we, government, UN, multilaterals, banks, CSOs and the private sector and individuals must redouble our efforts and in more concerted way. How can we do that? What does this mean in the context of the four principles for development effectiveness? Country ownership, meaning that countries set the priorities for national development and that development partners align their support accordingly. The focus on results, their inclusive partnerships, recognizing the criticality of contributions from a variety of act actors, including civil society and private sector engagement. And lastly, transparency and mutual accountability, implying that we have a joint responsibility in ensuring the availability of data and results for public scrutiny. I would also say that in this time of compounded crisis, we actually need to think even harder and recalibrate to, re to address rapidly evolving ch challenges in line with host countries' alerted policy directions. We need to have the tangible improvements for those most in need, and we need to work jo on joint actions under our inclusive partnerships, and we need to actually achieve more with less. So the transparency and mutual accountability is even more important at this time. This naturally brings us to our dialogues. And what I want is to turn theory into applied science of development effectiveness in changing development contexts. Turning to our panel and the work in Cote d'Ivoire, the Dominican Republic, Lao PDR and Peru for a closer look at the outcomes of multi-stakeholder action dialogues. Learning from these activities, uh, these are, it's an invaluable opportunity to understand how higher level principles of effectiveness can be translated into the practical day-to-day -day development on the ground. Allow me to kickstart the conversation uh, with a simple question to all our panelists. Can you tell us about the action dialogue in your particular country? If you can share with us when it happened, who participated, and what was agreed. And let me go by alphabetical order by country, so we don't end up in any protocol issues. Starting with uh, Monsieur Lasmel, Director General of Aid Coordination in Côte d'Ivoire. Okay, merci. Merci. Thank you. I take the floor here on behalf of uh, Her Excellency Mrs. Nelly Kaba, Minister of Planning and Development, who's not been able to be here. I would like to, on her behalf, thank you for this excellent opportunity you have given me to share with you the information of the uh, action dialogues in our country. As for the action dialogues in Cote d'Ivoire, it started in April 2021 and it was done in an inclusive and participative way according to the following stages. We firstly started with an awareness raising of the different uh, partners, social uh, partners and others. And this is based on of an uh, existing national structure, in particular the Committee for the Mobilization of Foreign uh, or External Resources, which uh, groups the different uh, national partners in order to discuss uh, foreign investment. We have wanted to have a more uh, wider uh, dialogue and open it to other partners and actors who are not necessarily engaged in this dialogue. For example, 
parliamentarians, the members of uh, the National uh, Inspection Authority and other international NGOs as well. We have carried out a survey to collect uh, and export data, which has allowed us uh, to draft uh, the preliminary re uh, report on the situation of uh, dialogues within uh, cooperation and identify, uh, identifying the challenges uh, present in order to improve um, development in, within the country. On the basis of this report, we set up a national technical workshop to validate the different challenges with the different um, focal points. That was in April 2022. And the next stage was uh, going to be organized uh, in the last quarter of 2022, but it hasn't happened, so it will take place um, beginning of 2023, and that was the uh, meeting with uh, the uh, civil society, private sector, the ministry, and other bilateral partners, um, parliamentarians, senators, etc. And from there, we will be uh, adopting a roadmap for all actors in order to put into action the different actions that have been identified in order to improve cooperation for development in Cote d'Ivoire. These are very briefly the most important areas that where we have been working in the area of the action dialogues in Cote d'Ivoire. I only had two minutes, so I've tried to be brief. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Director General Lasmel. Uh, for speaking about your roadmap and uh, the actions that will lay out what you're going to do in, in joint fashion moving forward. Mr. Murilo Frias, Director of International Cooperation from the Dominican Republic. Muchas gracias por la Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity as Dominican Republic to share our experiences on action dialogues. The last action dialogue carried out by the Dominican Republic took place in December 2021. And as part of this uh, action, the, we uh, had many actors of uh, our network, which is a system that has been uh, taking place in Dominican Republic now for a number of years, and that is starting to really uh, take place uh, since uh, the new government. This process has been led by uh, Vice Minister Laia Hotel, who is the one in charge of the development and, uh, areas. We saw representation from Ms. Viviana Manrique from the National Council and Mr. Mauricio Ramirez, coordinator, permanent coordinator for the UN system in the country and many other actors who are also part of the cooperation system like Melissa Paulino and Jose Luis Murillo, myself, uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Within the different agreements that we reached within this process, we obviously decided to base it on specific realities of the country in order to start to recover, uh, recover the economy and continue uh, encouraging recovery of the country, especially post-pandemic, how to use the different initiatives, the different recommendations made by the Action Dialogues and how we can translate them into and connect them with the 2030 Agenda. Each of these aspects, of course, had to be based on how to strengthen capacities of the whole of uh, the actors of the system. And this obviously implies involving other actors. And in this sense, we have tried uh, to include the academia and the private sector, as well as international organizations and other NGOs. We have had to review all the instruments we have, and this has led to defining new uh, monitoring instruments and tools that allows us how to define how these cooperation uh, projects are being articulated, how they're being uh, developed, and to see how all these aspects 
uh, fall into a national plan that allows the country to align itself with the strategy. This is a lengthy process, we are working on it, but we have progressed greatly. And to also share with us the very strong recovery angle to your uh, work. If I can turn to Madame Von Van. <coughs> Please. Thank you very much, Madam Sarah, for offering me the floor. And first of all, I also like to thank you, the OECD and the UNDP, for organizing this important conference and invite me to speak to this important session. Allow me to share a few important elements for context about the development cooperation in Laopedia. The Lao PDR and Development Partners signed the Wenjian Declaration in, 19, in 2015, which translates at the country level the principle of effectiveness and places them with our development coordination mechanism and processes. A long standing roundtable process takes the shape of annual roundtable meeting that took the stock of the development process to support the implementation of our five years national social economic development plan. We've owned line ministries, development partners, private sectors, CSOs, representatives. Every five years, we move to a new planning cycle and we have a high level round table process that involve our Excellency Prime Minister. Now let me briefly explain how happened the, during the latest action dialogue on the effectiveness development cooperation. As you know very well, Madam Sara, the high-level roundtable meeting took place in Wengchan last year, in November 2021 co-chaired by yourself and our Excellency Deputy Prime Minister. And we have honor uh, by our Excellency Minister to provide the key remarks addressed in the meeting. Of course, we do face a lot of challenges in implementing our uh, latest, I mean, the new five years National Social Economic Development Plan. And during the preparation for our high level meeting in last year, it took a lot of you know, uh, topics that we have discussed, uh, especially uh, to have a new and more substantive roundtable meeting, which in practice and several weeks of technical and high-level meetings. And the agenda included the technical and high-level session on key issues across sectors, financing for development, COVID-19 recovery, LDC graduation, in order to encourage you know, inter-ministerial and multi-stakeholder work on what is most important for our country. And the agenda also included the block on the development cooperation, that is, you know, what I can talk about briefly later. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madam Ponvan, for underlining uh, the recalibration that took place because of the COVID-19 and and the new priorities that were put in place. Mr. Gonzalez Norris, if I can turn to you from uh, the Peruvian International Cooperation Agency. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the Global Partnership and the UN uh, PD and OECD for the support and organization of this event, as well as our participation in it. In order to speak about the action dialogues uh, uh, that we are carrying out, we have organized a number of them in July 2022 online in this uh, post-pandemic -pandem recovery context we are in. Our dialogue had the uh, participation of Thomas, uh, His Excellency Thomas Haas, 
uh, Swiss ambassador of the partnership, and he also had uh, participation from many other actors of international cooperation from the state, the civil society, the academic sector, as well as the private sector. The most important thing here is that the dialogue is organized within activities that the agency is carrying out within the framework of the multi-sectorial uh, alliances, for example. The dialogue is therefore being integrated into different activities that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been carried out since 2017. And he allowed us not only to develop conceptually and practically all this structure, but it has also helped us to structure and formulate a, an action plan in order to uh, involve the private sector within the uh, actions of uh, the agency. We have identified more than seven million uh, dollars in different uh, areas that are being uh, brought on by the private sector to these initiatives. So that's very important. And the dialogue is also framed within a very important process that we're carrying out, a process to define a public policy for international technical cooperation uh, within the 2030 agenda. It's This is a public policy that is being uh, approved as we speak and that aims at improving technical cooperation through very specific measures in 2016. In 2006, we had an integrated uh, system of cooperation that promotes precisely all these synergies between different actors of the system, both on the public and private sector, so that the dialogue can be incorporated into a an existing structure within the Peruvian state, but coordinated, articulating it within the uh, academia, the private sector, and the civil society so that the dialogue precisely um, enables uh, incorporating all actors in a process that is being led indeed by the government through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Peruvian Agency for International Cooperation, but is a very uh, par participatory dialogue that is really allowing us all to participate in the process. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Gonzalez Norris for that, and I really like the way that you described the applied science of the principles in terms of integrating it into existing processes. Now, if I can turn to Ms. Elomo Andela, Head of Research and Partnership uh, of the NGO Collective for Food Security and Rural Development. I know you're not the convener of uh, action dialogues, but I'm sure that you have been invited and been included in them. Can you describe a little bit the role of CSOs and NGOs in the uh, examples you have? Thank you so much and thank you for having us here today. Um, as Cameroon faces three major well-documented crises, hindrances to the um, effectiveness of development cooperation um, on its path um, to becoming a newly industrialized country can be seen in different sectors and the recommendations made in the Action Dialogues Roadmap for Effective Development Cooperation, which was adopted just last week on the 8th of December, certainly reflect this. The Action Dialogue in the context of Cameroon thus should be seen as a multi-layered process, a continuum of development stakeholder interactions, principally led by the Ministry of Planning, the, the Economy and Regional Development that are anchored in the industrialization-driven National Development Strategy 2020-2030, yet that are very much co-owned under an inclusive and participatory approach to governance. For example, by the Ministry of Finance through the Budgetary Division, which works very closely with civil society across public finance management and reform, or the Ministry of Forest, which also relies on civil society for independent forest monitoring to NIP to name but a few. Program 23 of the Ministry of Planning is a good example of the outcomes of the focus on collaborative action, um, given that its main objective is to improve the nature and positive effect of various stakeholders contributing to the Cameroonian development process and to consolidate regional integration. I think we, you would all be aware that Central Africa, 
of which Cameroon is uh, very much a part, is the least integrated region in the world. Um, so this is expected to lead to the establishment of new participatory Islamic financial instruments, for example, as well as coordination mechanisms for Chinese development assistance, monitoring of the African continental free trade area, and further consolidation of the economic partnership agreement framework. Um, you also need to perhaps bear in mind that Cameroon is part of a, um, the, the biggest cooperative, collaborative um, economic social agreement that there is, which is between the European Union and the, the, the ACP uh, group of countries, African, Caribbean and Pacific. So that's, that itself speaks of um, a context of um, supercharged collaboration and cooperation um, sort of uh, focus. Um, so Cameron has been an active participant in the global framework for development assistance as well as being involved in the monitoring and evaluation exercises of the implementation of the related global commitments, which again speaks to, the, to a willingness on the part of many actors, including government, first to localize the global conversation on development cooperation effectiveness, second to ensure all actors are part of the solution, and third to keep the momentum around the SDGs. As a case in point, Cameroon took part in the 2019 voluntary national reviews and did so again this year. The country implemented a voluntary local review for the capital city Yaoundé in 2020, which I had I very much had the privilege of being a part of. Um, while a similar exercise has also been undertaken, undertaken in 2022 as part of the voluntary local review of the city of Marwa 1 um, in the far north region. But of course, to leave no one behind, um, these exercises would need to be rolled out across a wide range of local authorities. I mean, Cameroon has 374 local government councils, 360 municipal councils, and 14 city councils. Um, so you see the, the scope um, that there is to um, really uh, bring development cooperation um, at the grassroots level. Thank you. Thank you. And indeed, you, you raise uh, yet another level here, of course. We talk about bringing the action from our national, international conversations to the national level, but you also add the subnational level in terms of making sure that everyone knows what this is about. Many thanks for, for sharing this. We're going to be, I know you, many of you have already touched upon the how, but we're going to go dig deeper on these issues. So if I can please first turn to you, Mr. Lazmel. In your dialogues and the work that has followed, how have you furthered the effectiveness principles and adapted development cooperation to a new and rapidly evolving development context marked by, for example, the COVID-19 and, and the, the crisis that has followed uh, on, on fuel and energy and food uh, during the, the last uh, 10, 12 months? And importantly, if you can point out some of the challenges that you faced. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, as you know, as you've mentioned, action dialogues have allowed us to identify the main challenges that exist. I mentioned these challenges and that the objective was to make sure that we had more dynamism, we were trying to find more uh, effectiveness where this was possible. Now to reinforce these action dialogues and to make it more inclusive. We structured the action dialogue around uh, the priorities for action, including the SDGs at three different levels, at the global level, at the sectorial level, and at the local level. Now, at the international level, is uh, this is multi-sectorial, and here we are looking at strategic policies. Str <coughs> as well as uh, strategies for development and at the national level. We have a sectorial access, uh, which is really focused on the follow-up of policies. And at the local level, it is uh, concentrated on uh, the follow-up of priorities and the implementation of priorities. Now, very concretely, the Côte d'Ivoire government has adopted uh, this uh, action dialogue at the Council for Ministers in March 2022, which uh, enabled us uh, to make sure that everybody was involved in this process. So 
within the government. The government then adopted the institutional mechanism of the follow-up of the implementation of the National Development Plan 2022-2023 that integrates these three different levels of action. We want to make sure that we obtain very good results. Now, this uh, mechanism, which was operationalized uh, through sectorial working groups, uh, encompasses uh, all the different uh, participants that are involved in development and cooperation in Cote d'Ivoire. It also includes national actors and uh, technical and financial partners. Now, this mechanism creates uh, a uh, standing framework for dialogue where all the participants work in synergy to ensure that uh, we attain our development results uh, and make sure that uh, we follow up on our results at the three different levels, global, local, and sectorial. Now, within this uh, framework, the technical and financial partners have also worked uh, on their side on the review of uh, this uh, coordination framework in 2021 to better align themselves on the national dialogue system to improve accountability we have also undertaken some actions. We have a national policy in this area to assess public policies. We also have a piece of legislation regarding the assessment of uh, public policies that have been adopted by parliamentarians on the, in June 2022. We are looking at how to improve complementarity of these actions. The government started consultations with the different actors, such as the PTF. And so this was looking at how to we can align uh, these PTFs with national priorities. Now, at the level of the government, The other efforts that have to do with the, the development of a national policy on partnerships. We have a policy that takes into account the effectiveness of the cooperation and development efforts, and as well as the improvement of access to resources. We have also taken into account the data from the platform of external action in Côte d'Ivoire. The main challenges that exist to fully implement our national priorities and improve the effectiveness of cooperation and development in Côte d'Ivoire are the following. In terms of cooperation and the use of national resources, it will be necessary to identify the conditions in which taxation would permit us to, to better use national systems. So we need to review these uh, systems of uh, drafting the strategic plans. We need to make sure that there is a better harmonization between the different processes. Now, in terms of uh, measuring the results. We do think that we will have to put in a systematic review, such as monitoring and evaluation framework, and we need to make sure that uh, it works well. We need to have uh, regular statistical data that is disaggregated and uh, reliable that uh, has to come in. Now, to reinforce alliances and uh, partnerships, we really need to uh, implement uh, debates and uh, spaces uh, for discussions within government uh, to improve uh, transparency and accountability. We need to make sure that uh, we have uh, data available on the cooperation development to all stakeholders and to the public at large through the website portal that is now being developed. And it hasn't yet been finalized, but it is underway. We hope that it will be launched the next few weeks or months.
So those are some of the challenges and some of the experiences that I wanted to share with you regarding the process of the Action Dialogues in Good Year. Well, thank you. Thank you for your frank assessment of, of the work done today. If I can turn to uh, um, Murilo Frias from the Dominican Republic, can you uh, succinctly also elaborate a little bit around the challenges, but also how you have gone uh, ahead to accomplish what you've done? Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again. The challenges are the most essential in the países como nosotros, especially countries such as ours, where there is not a good, very strong. La República Dominicana eh, estuvo quizás la, eh, conectada a estos principios de eficacia, y es exactamente. And this, indeed, in this new man, management that we are trying to think in that direction, these principles logically are connected with uh, the fundamental principles for this new governmental management. And this is what has allowed us to strengthen three main areas. Firstly, to start setting up the institutional mechanisms that are already existing in the Dominican Republic. It's a legal framework that uh, so that entities already existing be able to articulate themselves so that we have the harmony in criteria that is de well defined according to what the legal framework established and thirdly of course to start strengthening institutions that do uh, receive international cooperation how they can use the resources connected to what the national priorities are and how these resources can really be made more transparent transparent, how can we connect them to the national decisions so that everyone feels that these cooperation resources are really reaching them. Logically, this involves or entails uh, strengthening leadership. It means that we need to create capacities. We need to have a constant support. And this is what the Ministry of Economy, Development and Cooperation is doing. But also the Foreign Affairs Ministry is also strengthening capacities through different technical capacitation uh, trainings. Another important aspect that we have understood is key is to avoid duplicities in the different efforts that are being carried out with uh, tra with cooperation. This means that we do not receive uh, requests for cooperation from the same institution for the same means. We have tried to rationalize this situation to make sure that everything can be streamlined from the Ministry of Economy. And another issue that is very important is how these resources can be channeled uh, to uh, national priorities. This is part of what we have done as that principle of appropriation to make sure we can move forward. Of course, there is also an issue of results. We have uh, moved forward, we have progress, we have tried to create new mechanisms, new tools that entail how to uh, monitor these actions, how to make sure, how, could to, how we can monetize everything that we're doing, how all the different state institutions uh, do uh, apply. And all this monitoring has been done along the way. We have improved greatly so far and we do hope that in uh, 2023 all these tools uh, will be implemented fully. As for uh, strategic partnerships, they are essential in the process. Cooperation has evolved in time. We have understood and within these uh, efficiency uh, and effectiveness uh, principles, we have involved the civil society, so they're part of it and they can support in the definition of these national uh, needs and to, to make sure that they they feel that the, the cooperation is really having a, a positive impact in society. And we are having as well a uh, technical uh, academic support and of course, the private sector are a very important support, innovative support for us in order to be able to carry out all the actions that we want to carry out within uh, co the cooperation field. As for uh, accountability, this is one of the most fundamental principles of the government and is part of what we have been doing, very much intertwined with uh, the uh, 
the effectiveness principles. So what have we defined? What are we doing? Firstly, we have started working on an international uh, development cooperation report to uh, establish all the to to, to lay out all the processes that we have set up, what resources we have been investing, what what is being done with the resources, what are the results, as well as reports on results on each of the strategic points that we have developed in the Dominican Republic. And finally, an analysis that takes us to analyze what the weak points are and what aspects we need to strengthen in order to continue progressing. Of course, there are many challenges still along the way, many areas that we have to improve in. One of them is the definition of a project methodology that really aims uh, at the national priorities. We're working on that for 2023 in order to be able to uh, conclude that process to define what are the transformative actions and define how we can ensure that state institutions be strengthened every day thanks to international cooperation and how to be more effective with those uh, cooperation resources aligned with our national priorities. And uh, in parallel, we have that experience on how to align those strategies with more uh, or less traditional uh, sectors like uh, the civil society or the private sector. We're working on that. And finally, how we can uh, support the cooperation system within the Dominican Republic and how to make sure that the actors within that system continue to articulate and improve that articulation to make sure that we can align and translate this into a better cooperation to improve the lives of all Dominican Republic uh, people. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, I, li I like the way that all of you have been referring to various processes and tools that you have made use of to try to hammer in these principles in the work uh, ahead. Let me turn to uh, Peru and to Laos and look at, um, in particular, the second effectiveness uh, principle and the focus on results. How do we know this? And some of you have touched upon it already in terms of how you monitor and evaluate and how, how do you prove that you have succeeded with, with uh, achieving a better development cooperation. If I can ask you first, uh, Mr. Gonzalez Norris from Peru, uh, can you tell us a little bit on um, how you have done this in your country context? Sí, muchas gracias. Yes, thank you very much. Well, as I mentioned in the first statement, I think that it is absolutely essential to include dialogue within the internal processes, within the national processes that have to do with development of this program of multi-actor cooperation. Now, this program also has to be translated to a national policy, such as the national policy of the technical cooperation. Now, through the conceptual development, uh, until the moment into, uh, at which we started the action dialogue, this was an enormous amount of contribution from a very long time to develop uh, this a program of a multi-stakeholder uh, framework. Now, on the other hand, I think that it's also very important, and dialogue has helped us here, to confirm something that uh, the pandemic really underscored, which is Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, because it, of course it is true that from the state's part, we have really started to try to work on this and to attain this, but it's also important for private sector, private companies, as well as the civil society in general. They need to really focus on this 2030 agenda. They should put it at the heart of their policies and do everything to be able to achieve these objectives. Agenda 2030, as we all know, this is a common joint agenda to all actors from a co in the world of cooperation. And I think that uh, we need to make sure that uh, Agenda 2030 is uh, maintained in everybody's uh, mind and we need to continue working on it, achieving the objectives. We also need to look at uh, 
how to associate ourselves uh, strategically and to better cooperate uh, amongst all the different actors. We need to generate complementarities uh, between all the different activities that uh, each actor is carrying out. Uh, we also need to look at uh, the challenges that, that still remain. Sometimes uh, we say that we need to join efforts, but uh, it should not just be the responsibility that lies entirely on the shoulders of the government, the civil society, uh, academia, private sector also have their responsibilities. The state will not substitute the role that they have to carry out. It has to be a complementary role. Everybody needs to work together. Companies will not to become an agency for cooperation, and neither will civil society or academia, but everybody has to fulfill their roles. And we need to find maybe points of convergence which will allow us uh, to achieve this Agenda 2030 altogether, as well as the sustainable development goals. Now, lately, we've spoken a lot about uh, building trust and a new relationship between all the different actors. I think that dialogue is a mechanism that is very useful for building trust. I believe that all countries should make sure that we really encourage, foster these dialogues because when we build a trust, that then that is when we are really listening to one another. It is key that these initiatives and These dialogues uh, should lead to concerted efforts uh, to try to implement uh, objectives in the area of development. We need to also have a results-based approach, which allows us to find common interest, to, to develop synergies, and uh, to undertake joint actions. Now, in this process, I believe that uh, a result uh, that we can demonstrate is the drafting of uh, operational manuals and uh, uh, booklets, guidelines uh, to develop uh, this multi-actor uh, development uh, systems. We do have protocols in our country that we have drafted that allow us to identify activities that can help uh, encourage concerted efforts and uh, concerted projects between different actors. We want to make sure that uh, everybody participates and they have their own role to play. And I, I have given some examples today. Of course, uh, dialogue ensures the advancement of these projects. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for those examples. I also hear from all of you um, the emphasis on resources and the resources available. Uh, and I know, of course, from the Lao context that you've been made use of the methodology um, uh, offered by the integrated national financing frameworks, where you look specifically at uh, both the uh, public and private international and national funding and financing streams, investment streams, if you wish, to try to uh, match and build the puzzle and articulate the policy actions that are a priority at any given time. Can you share a little bit of, of that work? Thank you very much, Madam Sarah. So thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so we are now implement, implementing the five years plan for the period of 21-25. And we have support from um, Madam Sarah and her team on developing financing strategy for the support for the implementation of the our existing five years plan. And this work has been done in a participatory uh, process. Of course, this is, you know, uh, as you mentioned, so we believe that uh, in order to support for the development, the financing strategy is very important. And alongside with the COVID recovery and also, you know, the practice that we are working together closely uh, between the government uh, and also the development partners. For the benefit of other panelists and the audience, Allow me to share, you know, the few words on this important work, which is the financing strategy. 
Of course, we do have, you know, challenges regarding, you know, the implementation of our plan. So that's why this uh, would support us. And I believe that uh, we have had, you know, an impressive growth rate, you know, in the past. And however, we do face, you know, a lot of challenges in terms of, you know, the shortage of uh, revenue, uh, I mean, collection and all the, you know, the limitation of capacities and also the um, other related areas, especially, you know, the um, resources to the support the development. So that's why um, we consider that financing for development was indeed it's very uh, important and it is a specific agenda item that we do need, you know, to work uh, continue working together and of course this you know continue from the what we have worked uh, together in 2020 roundtable implementation meeting and at the high roundtable meeting and we saw that the endorsement of key finding on the financing landscape and also the strategies policy areas of the focus and more than being you know, into the agenda and which is special about the financing strategy and why do we see as an example of development a cooperation that needs to be uh, replicated and what's uh, unique is that it was, you know, undertaken with a horn of government approach, as I mentioned uh, earlier, associated with 20 departments in, across the ministries and uh, 10 ministries and also a multi-stakeholder uh, setting, mobilizing the, the strengths and expertise of eight UN uh, agencies, the World Bank, TTGI, and other, like, for example, DFAT, JICA, and other development partners. And this is the nature of findings for development that bring all stakeholders together uh, because we need own uh, revenue streams, both public and private. And also it was ex extremely, you know, deliberative and transparent. Almost 20 days of uh, technical workshop took place within, you know, a space of 18, 18 months. And we know that it's the most challenging is to identify and resolve the trade-off, you know. And it is well focused result. It's a single agenda for all stakeholders to work together. And we are proud of this, you know, working with Madame Sarah and her team. And uh, we are greatly, um, we also ex like to express our special thanks to you, Madame Sarah, and your team for greatly facilita facilitated. Um, by your team with development partners and provided a resident coordinator as you, you know, uh, coordinating with development partners on this important work uh, to assist us. And we also uh, need to continue this, especially in the practical uh, term, I mean, in the real implementation and because these uh, resources to implement in our country, we have very limited uh, government budget, and we do need support from development partners through ODAs, and we, need, we do need to mobilize private uh, investment and other support from other sources. So this financing uh, strategy is a key tool for the government and development partners to not only for to mobilize resources to implement our existing plan, but to monitor the implementation and to align all the support from development partners as a team to our strategy in our country. So, and this financing for development will be an important agenda for all, for all of us. And, especially for our upcoming um, roundtable meeting to be conducted in early um, in January 2023. So we will, you know, um, discuss more on this, you know, 
how to involve development partners um, and own stakeholders to support the government of Laos PDR to achieve our goal and target and in order to work um, with all of you to achieve you know, the sustainable uh, goal. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Ponman. I know that one hour runs very, very fast and we are running out of time. But my two cents to this, before I give the word to uh, um, Isandela, is that there's no shortage of trying here, but it seems to me that making use of existing processes and ongoing effort and using clear and transparent tools are critical in order to give traction to the principles at, at country level, at sub-national level, and actually also making them uh, adhered to. Uh, because my own experience is also that you can have a, uh, I think someone said the other day, the principles, it's common sense. Of course, we want development cooperation to be along these principles. But when 59 or 75 development actors leave the room, they all have you know, many other things to attend to and it turns into bilateral uh, streams of work, which makes it very challenging for, for you to, to convene. So ex making use of these uh, tools that you've described and also having it as an ongoing effort in the existing processes appear very important. Now, if I turn to CSOs, because you have achieved a lot over the last decade in terms of both pushing your way into, but also increasingly being accepted by governments as part of the multi-stakeholder platforms. What are your key three points that you would want to continue to say to governments in terms of the importance of CSOs and non-governmental organizations? Thank you, Sarah. Um, well, I would first start by saying that there is uh, an accountability ecosystem gradually being created. Um, the Action Dialogue Roadmap, which I talked about earlier, should enable the government and its development partners to tap into the full potential of development cooperation, from devising new strategies to recover nationally and locally from COVID-19, to accelerating progress towards the realization of Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, which we know should be improved as public and private resources are currently not specifically channeled to support the SDGs. When it comes to um, implementing development cooperation at local level, um, due to the country's flagship decentralization framework recognizing the important role of associations, local area and village committees, and civil society more broadly, in contributing to the realization of um, the development objectives of territorial authorities, Cameroon certainly has, at least on paper, a favorable landscape for stakeholders to join forces effectively and efficiently. Um, I will say here that two of the main targets of the national development strategy will be to reduce the rate of poverty from 37.5% um, from figures um, of 2014 to less than 25% in 2030. Yet we know that um, goal two of the, sorry, goal one, of the of the uh, of agenda 2030 is to reduce to, to eradicate poverty completely. So I'm not sure how this fits into that vision because here we're talking about reducing it to less than 25% in 2030. So there is um, it, it kind of raises the question of the level of national commitment toward poverty eradication, um, and at the very least, it suggests that the work the working group due to be created within the Ministry of Economy, Planning and Regional Development with a purpose to analyze each sector of the national uh, development strategy, namely social, education, health, infrastructure, rural development, industries and services and governance should ideally include members with a strong orientation towards zero hunger, zero hunger poverty alleviation and reduced inequalities. Um, this is vital uh, not least because currently SDG 10, Reduced Inequalities, is the only unscored goal in the Cameroon SDGs dashboard due to unavailable data. So we don't have data 
on reduced inequalities. Furthermore, out of 17 um, SDGs, significant challenges were found in nine out of, um, out of the 17, uh, including goal 10, as I've just mentioned, goal 12, goal 14, goal, goal 15, and goal 16, which would echo what has previously been said in a different um, session about peace being almost the orphan concept in the human development peace uh, nexus. Now, in collaboration with the donor community, Cameroon is in the process of revitalizing the, um, its multi-partners committee, which is a government donor consultative platform to strengthen the cooperation and partnership around the national priorities and SDGs uh, implementation. So there is some work being done. Um, obviously, we would like to see more, but there is some work being done and we can't discount that. Going back to the rigorous approach being observed, for example, in independent uh, forest monitoring, this has enabled, is enabling civil society organizations to advocate more effectively for enforcement actions. Um, the standardized system of external independent uh, of observation has improved trust. I mean, this is a summit about trust. So this is one initiative um, within the Cameroon context where trust has clearly been improved between civil society on the one hand and um, civil enforcement officials um, in the other. Thank you so much. I know we are running over time and, and uh, um, other events are coming on, but I wanted to then add simply to say that to do what you are doing, put it on steroids and evidence base it seems to me what really needs to be done in order to try to rescue the SDGs by 2030. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank the panelists, all of you, for your contributions and your preparations. You have lots and lots to share, so I hope that the organizers have captured many of the points that you have made here. I'm not going to, to uh, try to summarize them due to time constraints. But again, thank you so much for participating in this panel and sharing your experiences of how to make the practice work. Thank you so much.